Good morning. One more time. Good morning. When you get up in Haiti, you get up at 4.30 in the morning, as some of my friends here from Haiti know, and you go house to house to house saying, good morning. Did the night pass well with you? Is your family safe? Now, can you imagine doing that in your neighborhood? I can tell you what would happen in my neighborhood if you did that. They'd have the authorities out on you. But I want you to turn to somebody next to you. And in Haitian, the way you ask, are you well, is como ye. If you're on the other half of the island of Hispaniola, you ask, como esta usted. So turn to somebody next to you and say, you know, how's it going? You know, como ye, como esta usted. Check. Attention, attention, you're starting to enjoy each other a little more than I planned. <laughs> Christine, I want to thank you for the gift of being here. It's really like coming home to family. We've met so many people that we've been with in other places. This is such a remarkable gathering. We work a lot of places. We've never found a place like this. People from so many different backgrounds really committed to making a difference for Christ. And we just want to thank you for the chance to be here and, and have some engagement. And afterwards, for those that want to get together, part of what we do is tell other people's stories. And so I'd like to get some ideas. We're going to be talking about creativity this morning. This room is filled with creativity. Learn about what you're doing, but also if you just want to get together and, and get after me for some of the things I've said or have some interaction, I like interaction. This is too big a group to have much, but over there afterwards. And then Christina will be outside with the books if you're interested in, in talking about the books. And we're looking for a couple of young people who could bring their support and work with us. We're trying to develop a creativity database, web page, newsletter. And so if there are any young people here that have a sense of calling to want to make a difference in terms of the future and the church, uh, do see us afterwards as well. Christine's going to read a passage that sets up what we're going to be talking about today. And her session at 315 is on the Shalom of God for the cities. She teaches a course on urban mission and the Shalom of God. I, I encourage you to check that out. But one of the major passages of scripture that has to do with both what she's going to be saying and what we're going to be dealing with today is out of Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. Listen carefully, open your Bibles and read with her. Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. We're going to be talking about God's purposes today for our lives and for the people he loves in the city. Well, to me, this is one of the most wonderful passages of hope in the Old Testament. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight, and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. They will not toil in vain or, build ch or bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, but dust will be the food, will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Dear Lord, we thank you this morning that you have a purpose and a vision for us for the future that is filled with hope. And I pray that as Tom shares this morning that you will help us to catch more of a sense of that vision and of your purposes for our future. I pray, dear God, that you will ignite us with your passion and your desire to see your kingdom come in all that we do. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I talked to a lot of people yesterday, right after the session, and people are saying, you know, what am I supposed to do with all this? How many of you felt just a bit overwhelmed with all the future stuff yesterday? Okay. Well, the future is a happening place, but tomorrow's challenges really are opportunities. And the question I got asked most often is, you know, what do I do? When I get back home, what do I do with this? Well, we're going to try to address that today, and we're going to try to get very practical. And before we're done, we're going to have you creating ways to do something with your life that's fresh and creative. And we're going to be talking about creativity today, not innovation for the sake of innovation, but innovation so that we can engage those new challenges in a way that really advance God's purposes. And those, that's what we're going to be after. So CDA 2008, we are challenging leaders to create new possibilities for the purposes of God for a new millennium. Three things we're trying to do in these two sessions. First of all, we need leaders who lead with foresight. All of you that are involved in urban ministries and church planning, I urge you, before you plan next time, do some forecasting. Find out how your community is going to be different in the next 10 years. Do a futures needs assessment. What are going to be the new needs, the new challenges? How is your resource base likely to change in the next 10 years? Then create new ministries that engage not just today's needs, but tomorrow's challenges. And CD, CCDA has a tremendous opportunity, I'm going to be talking to Wayne about this, of ways to kind of help us all to think down the road of peace and, and get futuristic. But this morning we're going to talk about leading with vision and leading with creativity. Now leading with vision, I'm going to be, I'm going to be speaking uh, out of our experience working with primarily white churches. The white church in America is in crisis because only 20% of our resource ever leaves the building. We work with white churches all over America that have big buildings and big budgets and they don't have a single ministry outside the building. And it's not just a crisis in our churches, it's a crisis in our discipleship. Less than 20% of the white churches we work with, less than 20% of the people in those churches can find two hours a week for anybody else. The, the evangelical cop-out is a little word on the job for Jesus and that's not going to get it done in the third millennium. We're going to need to get our churches out of the, uh, people out of the buildings, out of the houses, and we need to get our people involved in ministry and the only way to do that is to put first things first. So we desperately need to recover a vision. And then we need some creativity to reorder our lives, reorder our priorities and our congregations to put first things first. Little story to get us started. Uh, we are going to need some fresh creativity. And sometimes we have, a, those of us who are older, have a little harder time getting a hold of our imagination, our creativity. When I was a college guy, back when I was younger, we had a wonderful creative opportunity when a friend of mine, uh, just on impulse, while he was going to college, he just happened to find that this uh, guy down the street had this old funeral hearse for sale. This gigantic old funeral hearse, you know, the big square back end with the little curtains at the windows. Well, he drove that beautiful, beautiful vehicle on campus. And as soon as we saw that vehicle, we realized we had a creative challenge. We had to find some way to make use of this incredible vehicle. And so we started brainstorming. We finally got up an idea. We found by careful packing, we could load 13 students in the back of that funeral hearse all at the same time, lying down side by side, 13 of us packed in the back of that funeral hearse. Then my friend that bought this hearse proceeded to drive all over Portland, Oregon. Every kind, he, and he would race up to the stoplights or the stop signs, and every time he would come screeching up the stop signs, he'd slam on the brakes. All 13 of us would sit bolt upright at the same time. Cars drove up on lawns. Guys swam of their cigarettes. We'd lay back down, we'd wait for the next stop sign, we'd all come up together and we caused absolute chaos all over Portland, Oregon. It was so rewarding. We need a renaissance of Christian imagination. Amen. 
We need a renaissance of Christian creativity. Not innovation for innovation, but innovation to put God's purposes first. The number one crisis in the church today is a crisis of vision. And when I use the term vision, I'm not talking about anything hyper-spiritual in the clouds. I'm talking about the image of the better future. The image of the better future that we want for our families, for our lives, for our friends. We're in trouble because the image of the better future that drives our lives and decides where we place our time and money generally does not come from the Word of God. It comes from American culture. And we're in trouble. Aboriginal, Aboriginals have a saying after their experience with Europeans. They say, white man got no dreaming. White man got no dreaming. Him go another way. Their experience of the Europeans that came to Australia is that they didn't have spirituality, they didn't have soul, and they didn't have a vision for the future that came out of their faith. It came out of a whole Western progress myth that we're into big time in this society. There's a Christian author, uh, uh, Mr. K Kenneth Boulding, that said, no people, no society, no organization can long exist without some compelling image of the better future that calls us forward into tomorrow. And as John, John said this morning, without a vision, the people perish. But not only we are perishing, but the people we're called to minister in Christ's name are perishing because we do not have a vision at the core of our lives that really comes out of faith and out of Scripture. And it affects the way we do discipleship. We do discipleship where Jesus is little more than a devotional lubricant. We try to get in around the edges while we try to get up the mountain and get ahead. We need to go back to the Bible and find a new reason for being. Yesterday we took some trips. We took some trips back to the future. I want to take some, uh, a couple trips with you. The first one by way of a children's story called Hope for the Flowers. Now Hope for the Flowers is a little kid's story about a caterpillar by the name of Stripe. Stripe the caterpillar in the story starts wandering through the grass on a warm spring day. All of a sudden Stripe the caterpillar comes upon a most unusual, incredible uh, sight. Sight, strike the caterpillar comes upon a humongous mountain of other caterpillars clear up into the clouds and beyond all driven by the same obsession climb or be climbed they have to find out what is at the top of this huge caterpillar mountain well stripe has never seen anything like this before stripe checks it out this way and stripe checks it out that way and the more stripe checks it out the more stripe gets caught up in the contagion and as the story ends stripe climbs in and starts climbing and at tremendous cost to himself and other caterpillars he finally makes it to the top of this huge caterpillar mountain only to discover there's nothing there at all <laughs> nothing at the top how many of us are climbing caterpillar mountains I can tell you a lot of folks in the white church they're trying to get ahead in their careers they're trying to get ahead in the suburbs and never ask what's at the top we are in crisis because we bought the wrong dream the storytellers of the Enlightenment told us a new story. It goes something like this. They took the vertical quest for God and God's kingdom, and in the age of reason, the Enlightenment, they tipped it over on its side. It became the secular pursuit of Western progress, Western materialism, economic growth. What drives Mac world is this passion for more economic growth. And for too many Christians, the, the central dream, the central notion, the better future in our lives is getting ahead, getting up that mountain, upscaling, and getting a piece of the rock. The reason we don't have time and we don't have money to invest in urban ministry is because we've sold out to another dream. It isn't the biblical dream. The way it comes into Christian homes in America is everybody wants what's best for their kids. Is there anything the matter with that? Of course not. But because of the pervasiveness of the American dream, we define what's best in largely economic and materialistic terms. In the white, middle-class, suburban communities, uh, think about how we raise our kids. We surround them with their own TV set, their own CD player, their own telephone. When they get to be a certain age, their own automobile. You know what I'm talking about? Every Christmas, looks like the department store blew up in the living room. What's the message to the young? The message to the young about what is important are things. We're not losing our young to the cults in the new age, and we are losing them. We're losing them to the new religious shrines of devotion in America. That's where the young are going to do their devotions and get their connection. And we desperately need to go back to the Bible and discover God's got an alternative to the American dream. The good life is not how much you can accumulate in one lifetime. It's not getting all the toys. God has another dream that is at the center of what John was calling us to this morning. Life with purpose, life with mission, and God at the center of our lives. Now I want to take a trip back to 7th century BCE. 
when we go back to a wilderness, 7th century BCE, it's going to jet us forward into the ultimate future of God. So now, by way of Isaiah's vision, what, which Christine read this morning, picture yourself in a wasteland in which there's not a single blade of living grass. Now, rising up out of that wasteland before us as we start to walk through this desperately barren land is a mountain that transcends every other mountain. Now, look to the horizon, small dots, small dots, and as they get closer, we see their people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. As they start up that mountain, Isaiah 35, 1 to 7, something remarkable happens. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame run at the top of that mountain. There is a banquet, Isaiah 25, 6 to 9. There is a celebration. Tony Campola has got it right. There is a party. And God is in the midst of that party, wiping away all tears from their eyes. What are God's purposes for the future? It's not getting a piece of the rock. God's purpose is to create a new heaven and a new earth. God's purpose is to bring justice to the poor. God's purpose is to bring peace to the nations. God's purpose is to bring reconciliation between people from all different kinds of backgrounds. And we're going to be a part of an incredible international homecoming. And the day of the Lord, we are going to come home together with brothers and sisters from every tongue, tribe, and nation. The blind will see. The deaf will hear. The poor will be brought to the table of honor. They will be the honored guests at the banquet feast of God. Now that is a different dream than the American dream. The American dream is an individual dream about me getting my piece of the rock. This is a corporate dream. The American dream defines the good life in economic terms. This is a dream that defines the good life in service, in restoration, in healing, in celebration. We need this dream at the center of our lives. We need to raise our kids with a different purpose than doing well in school so they get the high paying jobs. We need to raise them so that they can become servants of our Lord. Now Jesus stands up in the temple at the beginning of his ministry and what does he read out of as he begins his ministry? He reads out of Isaiah 61. And right against the tapestry of this huge dream that, that just pervades the Old Testament, he stands up and says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, release to the captives, sits down and says something quite remarkable today. Today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And what he's doing is not just announcing his vocation. He's talking about what it means for him to be Messiah. Now, we kind of got it all confused because it's got, we've gotten off on a kind of discipleship that simply isn't biblical in the white church. There's much more of this imagery in the black church, but in the white church, we're so much into the American dream, we're not in touch with this. Jesus, John sends two of his disciples in Luke 7 to find out if Jesus is really the one or not. What evidence does Jesus offer to John's disciples that he is indeed the chosen one of God? Go tell John what? The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame run, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, and blessed is the man. Blessed is the man who has not offended me. The proof of the fact that he was the chosen one of God was not only was committed to God, he was committed to the purposes of God. Now guess what it meant to be a disciple in the first century. Today to be a disciple in the white church, it's God in my heart, sins sin forgiven, and pretty much go about life as usual. A little word on the job if you get a chance. In the first century, there's no way you could claim to be a disciple doing that. In the first century, to be a disciple of Jesus, you not only had to commit your life to God, you had to do exactly what Jesus did and commit your life to the purposes of God. Sight to the blind, release to the captives, good news to the poor. Ministry wasn't optional, and a little word on the job for Jesus wouldn't get it done. In the first century, those people quit jobs and left homes because they not only committed their lives to God and got their sins forgiven, they had what Walter Brueggemann calls a new reason for being. They had a new purpose for life that fundamentally reordered their lives. It reordered where their time and money went. And we've got to find ways to call the church back to whole life discipleship because here's where we're in trouble. In the churches that I work with, we're doing dualistic discipleship. It comes right out of modernity and Western culture. There's a lot of talk about post-modernity these days, and I, I, we're not going to get into all that. But in the modern culture, there's a dualism. It goes right down the, through the center of modern European culture, and we bought it lock, stock, and barrel. Here's how it impacts our discipleship. In dualistic discipleship, 
What we do is on this side of the line is getting our jobs, getting ahead in the suburbs, getting our upscale lifestyle started, getting our kids off to their activities, and running outrageous busy sh uh, schedules. On this side of the line is 15 minutes in the morning with Jesus in church on Sunday. Do you know what I'm talking about? The research shows that whatever you believe about Jesus on this side and the white churches in America has nothing to do with how you use money over here. Now, white Christians, will, sometimes we'll, we'll rail against materialism and consumerism, but it doesn't affect the fact that we participate in it, and there's no connect between what we believe in our faith and how we use our time and money because of a dualism that's tearing us apart. We need to call people to back to whole life discipleship, and it, it begins with rediscovering that we're all called to be missionaries for God. We're all called to be involved every week with our kids in making a difference, and not just the, the paid folks that are working in the cities and the pastors. We're all called to be ministers. Well, what would that look like? If we decided to seek first the purposes of God, how, how do you begin a journey towards whole life discipleship? Well, Christine and I have a friend. His name is Jerry Sitzer. Jerry Sitzer teaches theology and religion at a Presbyterian college in Spokane, Washington. Four years ago, Jerry Sitzer experienced an incredible crisis. His wife, one of his kids, and his mother-in-law were killed in a tragic automobile accident. Out of that tragedy of that, as a single parent dad with three kids left to raise on his own, what to do? For weeks, Jerry struggled. What to do? What to do? At just the enormity of the grief, and finally one day it occurred to him to sit down with his three kids and use the word of God and hammer out and write a family mission statement. And the kids sat down with him, they wrote a family mission statement. Now every week they get together and see how they're going. The way back away from doing the American dream with a vengeance and working Jesus in around the edge is to make Jesus' vocation our vocation and every single person pastor in your church think about a 10-week course where you start with the scripture and you put them in touch with the incredible purposes of God for a new heaven and a new earth, the vocation of Jesus and help them write a personal or family mission statement and then begin the journey towards whole life discipleship of reordering where their time and money goes, how long they work, how much activity for the kids, because people in your church, pastors, people are outrageously out of control busy and they have no idea to take whatever you preach Sunday morning and make decisions about Monday through Friday. They have no idea. There's no connect there for them. Have a class and provide the connect. Help them write that firm personal family mission statement and then start to help them reorder their time and their money to really put first things first. You know what we need to do it in our churches too? Luther Place was a white Lutheran church uh, in, in a, a community in Washington, D.C. a few years ago that was starting to become a, a multiracial community. And so like a lot of white churches, they voted whether to stay or whether to go. Well, to their own surprise, they voted to stay. They voted to stay. Well, before, they were perfectly happy just being a white Lutheran church in Washington, D.C., and they didn't have to have a purpose. Like most of our churches, they were afflicted with a disease I call chronic randomness. Chronic randomness. The men's group going this way, and the women's group going this way, and the young people going in another direction. Once a year, you have a potluck. And celebrate the fact you're still doing some of the stuff this year you did the year before. Nobody knows how it all fits together. There's no purpose. There's no integrating focus, chronic randomness. So these good people said, if we're going to stay, we need to have a purpose. And so they went to praying, they went to searching scripture, and being a sacramental church, they discovered as God has hospitality to us and the bread and the wine of the Eucharist, the communion, we need to be hospitality in a broken and needy community. They slashed a lot of programs they're doing. Everything they reinvented was focused around a singular purpose to be the hospitality of Jesus Christ and a community that needed to know about God's love. Folks involved in urban ministry, we can no longer just have mission statements about direction. We need to biblically define why we do what we do. We need to write down what our biblical assumptions are. Too often we work from what I call a set of immaculate assumptions. Like we all know what the mission of the church is. We all know what it means to be a disciple. We just need to go out and do it. We don't know. We don't know. We need to sit down and write down our assumptions. One of the assumptions we wrote down in the Haiti project I was involved in, we wrote down our biblical assumptions. One of them is that God was alive and well and at work in Haiti before we got there. Now I believe that and I believe it's biblical. Now because we wrote that down, we had to act on it. So when we got there, we'd done a needs assessment two weeks before and found out what their needs were and they wanted buildings and tractors and a lot of expensive stuff. 
But we wanted to find out how God was alive in a well. So we went around a second time and asked them, what dreams, what dreams is God giving you for your family and for your community? And we heard people say, you know, our, our community of 10,000 people, there's so many divisions, people at one another's throats, we want to see reconciliation. You know what? 80% of our kids don't go to school. We want to see them go to school. And we want to see a spiritual renewal. We never would have found out what was stirring those hearts and what God was doing if we hadn't asked the question. So I urge you to do the hard biblical work of writing down your biblical assumptions of why you do what you do. We need to go back to the Bible and not just use it devotionally. We need to use it culturally. We need to find a new purpose for our lives, new purpose for our congregation, new basis for ministry. Once you do that, then we need to get creative. Again, not innovation for the sake of innovation, but innovation to address those new challenges that are coming at us in the third millennium at breakneck speed, but also ways to put God's purposes first. So what would it look like if we really decided to put God's purposes first, first of all, in our lives? Well, it'd mean helping every family develop that personal mission statement. It would mean starting to, to talk about putting first things first and calling every individual and family to be involved in ministry. InterVarsity Christian Fellowship on the West Coast. You know what they call it? Challenge those young people to do? They challenge them to give God the first year out of college and work in urban ministries. And they live in shared housing in Southern California and Seattle and they're working with the poor. We need to challenge every family, every individual. Now business people can get a master's degree at Eastern College and do small business development, microenterprise development in the inner city. There are ways you can do it through your work. But if you can't do it through your work, then Christine and I challenge every family in the church that's where it's possible, it isn't possible for everybody, but many could free up two to four hours a week, change their time style to free up two to four hours a week to be involved in ministry. I was working in a Presbyterian church and asked those good Presbyterian folks, what is it that bonds American Christian families together? I mean, what do we do, to, what do, we do together more than anything else as parents and kids in Christian homes? Eat. Eat. Big Mac hamburgers, uh, sitcom television trips to the mall. What bonds our life together, just like the people outside the church, is what we consume together. One of the reasons we're not effective in evangelism, we're so much like the culture around us, we don't have much to offer. We hang around church buildings a little more. We abstain from a few things. We don't do hedonism as well as the folks around us, but we sure keep trying. So... <laughs> The reason we're not effective is that we're so much like we haven't allowed God to change all of our lives. So part of what we need to do is to challenge families to be families for others. So I said that in this Presbyterian church. I said, let's get families bond together with parents and kids doing ministry together. Because I said, I've never seen a church, black, white, or Hispanic, that facilitates parents and kids doing ministry together. I know some families who do it. I don't know any churches that are helping make it happen. Came back to the church a few weeks later. The church hadn't changed but this woman came up to me. She said, we are doing it. I said, what are you doing? She said, because of your challenge, we've changed our time style and we've freed up one evening a week. And I said, good on you. She said, also because of what you... And she said, we're working with senior citizens who are invalids, who are in their homes, and they're going to lose their homes if somebody doesn't help them with their chores. But she said, also because of what you said, we bring our little preschoolers with us. And they're not watching mom work, they're right down the floor, scrubbing the floor alongside. Now what would we raise up if we put sight for the blind, release to the captives, and good news for the poor at the center of family life, instead of hanging out at the mall and watching sitcom television? We need to call families to be families for others. Christian radio doesn't talk about this. We need to start focusing on families who are reaching out and making a difference instead of just getting kids ready to make a dollar. We need to challenge them to do something different. When we speak on Christian college campuses, and we speak at most of them one time or another, uh, we, challenge the, we try to provide an, a counter message to what they hear. Because for all the talk about the Lordship of Jesus, like I said yesterday, what they're hearing in Christian homes, churches, and colleges is Agenda 1 is getting your career, Agenda 1 is getting your house, Agenda 1 is getting your lifestyle, and then with whatever you have left over, follow Jesus. That is not the message we give. The message we give is that Decision 1 is not where to work, it's not where to live, it's not even who to marry. Decision 1 is how is God calling you to use your life to make a difference for God's kingdom, and then decide where to live, then decide where to, who to marry, and how to order your lifestyle around your ministry vocation. We need to challenge a new generation to put first things first and reorder our lives so we can be people with a difference. Now, how do you do that?
How do you do that? Christine and I are both type A people. Christine came down with chronic fatigue syndrome because in Christian ministry, she was trying to do too much. Anybody here feeling a little overstressed, a little overcommitted, a little overbooked? Yeah, it's an addiction. We're, we're crazy performance oriented. I had a pastor say, say to me once, because of my problem with this, he says, Tom, he said, you know this business of dying for the kingdom? I said, yeah. He said, it's been done once already. You don't have to do it again. <laughs> Some of our drivenness is messianic. You know, God's going to bring the kingdom whether we kill ourselves or not. And God has for us a way of life that's more festive, more celebrated, with an easier rhythm, rhythm than the rat race. We, we can find a better way of life. So what Christine and I have learned from our Catholic friends is to take some time to go on a prayer retreat. One of the most self-evident characteristics of Christ's prayer life that we Protestants don't talk about a lot is that Jesus took these extended times with God to really get it right. Well, if Jesus needed to do it, we need to do it. And so four times a year, Christine and I go on a prayer retreat. We take a couple days, we take our Bible, we take our journal, we don't intercede, we don't pray for others this time, we wait for God to tell us where we messed up. It's a time of repentance, it's a time of getting our act together, it's a time of listening, and out of this we rewrite our family mission statement. At the center of our family mission statement is Proverbs 31, to be a voice for those who have no voice. We both worked in international mission, we have a tremendous concern for the poor and trying to get the church involved. So that's our mission statement. Then we come out of this retreat time with new goals for our, not just our spiritual life and our ministry, but for our marriage, for our hospitality, for our family life. One of the things that God has called us to is the ministry of hospitality. We are spending more money now and more time than ever before. We like to cook for people. We both cook half time and we cook food from all over the world. Part of the gift of God in our lives is we want to teach people to celebrate the kingdom. We want to teach them to party better. We were with some uh, uh, charismatic Christians in Britain recently and said, you're, you folks are great good fun to be with on Sunday during praise worship. But I said, frankly, the rest, rest of the week you're a little bit of a drag. Because <laughs> we really don't know how to take our celebration. So we try to teach people to party the faith. And we have African nights where we have food from Africa, ground nuts, stew, and different dishes. We have a celebration called Advent 2 Homecoming every, every Christmas Christmas season to teach people to party, the great homecoming. And so we spend more time partying, celebrating, and doing hospitality, but we are also asking the question we also all need to ask, how much is enough? We found we didn't need two cars, and we need to start figuring out where we can pare back so we've got time or money for what's important, particularly in the white church. Many people in the white church could double, triple tithe and not hurt themselves at all. Uh, can I just say a word here? Pastors, you might want to disagree with me, so come and chew on me afterwards, but I want to tell you the tithe isn't biblical. Not in the New Testament. I understand the Old Testament origins. In the New Testament, following Jesus is a whole life proposition. It was never a 10% deal. Zacchaeus didn't give 10%. It was half to the poor and four times anyone he cheated. And the rich young ruler was told to give it all away. And in too many white churches, they, they, they say that's just a, 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 just a, a commitment quiz. You know, if the rich young ruler had only been willing, then Jesus would have given it all back to him so he could go witness to his other rich neighbors. That's... <laughs> That's very convenient, but it's not biblical. So we need to challenge people to change time style and lifestyle. I challenge you, husbands and wives, single people, if you've never gone on a prayer retreat, go on a prayer retreat and get as much time freed up as you can and just keep those windows open. Don't, don't schedule anything else. Enjoy having a little space in your life. Get off some of those committees. Get out of some of that busyness and have some time in your life for prayer because the center of whole life discipleship is a life of prayer and scripture study and learning to live with much greater celebration. And then once we do that in our personal lives, putting first things first, we need community. The only way we can be whole life disciples is in community where we're known, loved, and held accountable. Now, one of the things I talk about in white churches, white evangelical churches, terrifies them because I tell them about some Mennonites in Indiana. Mennonites have small groups, and we all need to be in small groups, but these small groups are different. They don't just study scripture and disciple one another and help one another out in hard times. Twice a year in Goshen, Indiana, this one Mennonite church, everybody in a small group brings their time schedule and their budget and opens it before everybody else in their small group and say, now, how can we use our time and money in the next six months to really put God's purposes first? You can see upper middle class white folks blanch. You can see them sucking air when I talk about that because that is really uncomfortable because we're so much into an individualism that comes out of Western American culture. It doesn't come out of the kingdom of God. We need communities where we're known, loved, and held accountable. But do you know what we also need for the under 35? Under 35, raise your hands again. Under 35. 
you guys are going to have you're, you're, you're going to have a wretched time with the whole issue because the economy changed and the cost of housing has gone up tremendously the first house I bought uh, did I mention the house yesterday? I don't think I did. The story, I was working at a Christian college with a welfare income of 4800 a year. That's what they were paying back then. It wasn't much, but I bought a four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath house with a full basement and totally been restored. New roof, new plumbing, modern kitchen, modern bath, $14,500. $100 a month payments, and I had no trouble on one welfare salary of 4800 making that payment. That house today is around 400000 Two young people with good income can't make the, make the cut. We need to think about whole life discipleship and whole life stewardship. We need to see whole life discipleship where we don't just take the furniture that modern culture hands us. Single family detached housing is putting us in, in debt for 30 years. Young people today over half their income, the best hours of the day and the best money they make goes to a mortgage company. We can be more creative than that. Something that's been going on in Denmark for 20 years is called co-housing. These are people that aren't even religious, they just figured out on their own that single family detached living is terrible expensive. So they built like a condo with a purpose. 75 units, three bedroom, four bedroom. Uh, they, instead of uh, having these huge recreation rooms that many people my age have, you know, that you use twice a year, they have one recreation room for 75 people and they have meals there every evening. 90 cents per person, every couple cooks every once every two months. You don't have to eat there. This is not the communes of the 60. You got your own kitchen, but they prefer it. They share child care, they help one another out. Instead of backyard and front yard, they got one area where they grow their gardens together and got another area where the kids play together. They discovered it's a better way of life. There is a, a Rock Ridge Methodist Church, Oakland, California, in, in an interracial community is building the first Christian Go housing project this right now while we're here. It's, it's multicultural, it's intergenerational, it's a witness for the kingdom, it's less expensive to build, it's less expensive to maintain, and it's a mutual lifestyle. Jeff Wright, who is at this conference, is doing the same thing in Southern California, and Jeff, I still want to get that story. So we need to find some ways. What I talk about with so many groups is building a sixplex. Six three bedroom, one bath units for young couples. And you can do it in Seattle on a third of an acre. What a young couple would have to start off in Seattle to buy a house, 150,000 fixer up or tiny two bedroom would cost you a half million over 30 years. You could build these three bedroom units on a third of an acre for about 60,000 a year, uh, 60,000 a unit with some invested labor five-year no-interest loans. Where do you get the no-interest loans? From the people over 50. There are a lot of us people over 50 who hit the economy at a very good time. And if we could get six older couples to float six $60,000 loans, these young, keep, young people, instead of spending a half million over 30, spend 60000 over five. Do you understand the savings here in terms of whole life stewardship? Have those young people pay two more years beyond payout for the kingdom. Do you know what that would free up? $144,000. What would $144,000 do in your project? Could make a tremendous difference for the kingdom. Kingdom. I can tell you in Africa it would mean 100 homes for the poor. At the end of the seven years, these six, young, six couples wouldn't have any more mortgage payment. Nothing in the word of God says you've got to work 30 years for a mortgage company. You'd set some people free. Then they could go to their employers and if they could work it out, they could work 20 to 30 hours a week instead of 40 to 80. So they would have some time to work for sight for the blind and release to the captives and good news to the poor instead of just struggling to get to church once in a while. And we need to find some ways to put first things first in terms of the church and ministry. Many American churches, like I say, white churches I work with, don't have a single ministry outside the building. Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, we find so many churches that are really committed to making a difference, much more than we find in the States. Sprayton Baptist, Christ Church, New Zealand, is a church of 800 members. They're a church that want to make a difference. The pastor's study looks like a Sunday school supply room they forgot to paint. Nothing fancy. And they do that so 60% of their budget goes out the door to urban ministry and third world ministry. That small, that congregation of 800 has 25 thriving urban ministries, including a kingdom trust to provide small loans to start small businesses. We've got to find new ways to plant churches, to reach a new generation. There's a church in England called, uh, Bra that, where they bought a, a brown bear pub, they called it, reaching out to Caribbean young people. They put together a reggae band, and they're finding a whole new way to reach out in a community uh, of people from the Caribbean, and we've got to plant new churches. But in terms of urban ministry, we've got to get creative as well. In Seattle, there's a recognition if the church is to have a future, we've got to raise up a new generation. So Emerald City Ministries and something called Vision Youth are both committed 
to raising up a new generation of black leaders in our city, and that's part of what we need to do. Job Ebenezer in Chicago is developing agricultural projects, rooftop gardening, urban agriculture. Because of the challenges we're going to be facing economically because of McWorld, we need to help people become much more self-reliant in growing their own foods. MEDA that's represented here is providing loans in Haiti to help the poor help themselves. We need MEDA-type programs in our cities in St. Louis and Chicago and Detroit. Nehemiah Housing is helping people gain home ownership, and you're learning about that while you're here. Uh, we're going to have to find new ways to fund urban ministries. Will and estate planning, a lot of people over 40 have money. You need to start training some people to get to those people and say, we want to help you out with your will planning and your estate planning. There's going to be a $13 uh, billion dollar transfer of wealth, and you need to get to those boomers before they get to the nursing homes and help them with their wills. Uh, Phil Wall in, in Britain does urban ministry, and he works with AIDS orphans in Africa, and one of the things he's found is a new way to raise money. This, we just talked to Phil, and we work with Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, great things happening. And what he does, he doesn't go and ask people for money at banquets to raise money for AIDS orphan. He uses the parable of the talents, and he gives them money. He took all of his family's money out of savings with his wife's permission. He got other people to do it, and they have a banquet. And they give everybody that comes to the banquet 10 pounds apiece, which is about $15 U.S. And then he gives them a list of ideas, and he says, now, if if you need this money more than AIDS orphans do, that's fine. You just do what you want with it. But if, if you want to make a difference for the kingdom, I'm giving you a time deadline. Three months in the future, we want you to bring your, 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 your ties back, your talents back. And here's some ideas of ways to invest it. And every time they've done this, they've had a tenfold increase on the money that they've given out to make a difference for the kingdom. We need a new level of creativity, and we need to do what John Perkins has been talking about for years. We do need to relocate and re-involve ourselves. There are eight couples in East London, white young couples that want to make a difference in a Caribbean community. They've moved back in. It's still got some middle class folks. It's got even a few wealthy folks, but a lot of poor people from the Caribbean. They're doing uh, job training ministries. Uh, they're doing tutoring. They've started some great co-op uh, house uh, food programs where you can buy food much for much less. But one of the things they did that's a taste of the kingdom is they got people together and they decided to celebrate the first year of their ministry to have a whole community-wide celebration. So they put on a banquet. In this huge round room, they put up tables. They got the fruit vendors to loan them fruit, and they have this huge island in the center of all this fruit. The, the flower vendors gave them uh, huge quantities of flowers hanging from all the beams. The people in drug and alcohol rehabilitation made these pageants. They charged people a pound each, that's a dollar and a half each. All of the poor came to this banquet with pork, uh, with salmon, with chicken. They even had a vegetarian table, and they had a kosher table. 400 people came and had a taste of the kingdom of God. The, some of the artists in the community came and did their violins, they had puppets, and they celebrated the good news of the inbreaking of God's kingdom. My friends, we not only need to do much more to find ways to help people to help themselves, we've got to learn to party better. We not only need to focus on the needs, we need to learn to celebrate the good news that the kingdom has come. All that God purposes for us is a purpose of hope and renewal. God has given us a hope and a future. Now, I want you to turn to somebody next to you, and I want you to create one new possibility for your life, for your kids, for your church, for the urban ministries. Talk about one creative way to put first things first, God's purposes first, to address the new challenges of new millennium. Talk to those people next to you. Let's talk story. Let's create some new models. Talk to one another. It's creativity time. creativity workshops. I would urge you before you plan next to do forecasting, 
to really try to write down out of scripture why you do what you do, but do some brainstorming. What you're doing in these moments is very important. Just want to get a couple people to quickly share. I got a few young people because they're the future of the church. Just to share quickly a couple of ideas that have come out of these moments together. Uh, these were people from different communities, right? They're just getting here for the first time. Tell them about it and what your idea was. Okay. Well, um, we, we have been talking about discovering an old idea, um, which is the early church of Acts 2 and 4, and uh, living in the community that Jesus set up there. And there's a few of us from a lot of, of different places. One that we're talking to is from Omaha, Nebraska, and we're from Philadelphia. But we both are rediscovering that community um, and and trying to live it out and, and it's it's an amazing thing as we're beginning to to share things in common not as a prescription of how what community is but they shared everything in common because they fell in love with each other and with God and that's what we were talking about over there okay so. thank you There are a lot of families here, and I found a young couple that are struggling with what a lot of us need to struggle with, and they've got some beginning ideas. Don't sit in the front if you don't want to be called up here. <laughs> um, basically, my husband and I were talking through um, the struggle and attention of desire, our parents teaching us a lot of wanting to live the way they didn't have to live, the way they didn't struggle. And both of us have lived fairly sheltered lives and haven't had to struggle a lot. And so we see that desire to try to maintain um, what we've got, which is American, an American dream. And so instead of being content in a lifestyle of a nine to five ministry, which you're really isn't ministry if, if it's just nine to five really being called beyond that to live in community and give of ourselves and to be freed up to experience that freedom i mean john perkins has said time and time again to to make a lot of money save a lot of money and give it all away and i really long to to be that type of person that doesn't try to find out how can i, I can save more money but to give it away and feel that freedom so okay thanks so much <laughs> It's a gift to be here at the threshold of the third millennium. It's a gift because God has given us a reason for being. In the wonderful imagery of Isaiah and in the vocation of Jesus, we find purpose. God has gifted us with creativ creativity and imagination. And Christine is going to be at the back table. The Live It Up book, uh, How to Create a Life You Can Love, is essentially a book on creativity. I'm going to be over here. I'd love to talk to some of you about the creative things you're already doing. Let me say a prayer. Creator God, we pray you'll blow through our imaginations and help us to imagine and create new ways to put your purposes first to address the urgent challenges of tomorrow's world. Lord God, help us to live with a much greater sense of celebration and fulfillment in anticipation that day when the kingdom celebration breaks out of the great homecoming of God and we are all brought home together, sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.